I had always loved to travel. I enjoyed seeing different places, the adrenaline rush of climbing a mountain, and of course, sharing a few beers with the locals. However, despite many great experiences along the way, I always felt like I was just passing through. I wanted my next trip to mean something. While researching various issues, I came across a few articles about refugees fleeing a small nation on the coast of the Red Sea. The country was called Eritrea. Until then, I had never heard of it or even noticed it on a map. As I explored this topic, I read about protests boiling in Washington, D.C. on Eritrea's Independence Day. I decided to make the drive from Philadelphia with my friend Joe to check it out. Everything is hidden, no information, no at all. Eritrea, I always say, is the United States frozen 200 years ago. We love our first president, which is the George Washington of Eritrea. Eritrea is trying to feed the poor. Eritrea is trying to feed those who are in poverty. We were getting conflicting stories. Was Eritrea, like Sam said, peaceful and harmonious? Or were these protesters telling the truth? A few of the protesters invited us back to the hotel to celebrate their Independence Day. Before the party, we had a chance to ask a few of them about what life is like living in Eritrea. People leave Eritrea because the situation in Eritrea, everybody knows, is very bad. It's one man show. There's no constitution, there's no election. Huh? Your life is in a military service all, all your life. People disappearing without trace. Your salary is $10 per month. How, how can you feed your family? How can you feed yourself? How can you help the others? There is no hope. If there is no hope, uh, people, they have to just uh, look for another option. I wondered what other options they had. It was a lot to take in, but one thing was certain. These Eritreans embodied a lively and contagious spirit. It was hard to imagine a government willfully abusing such a vibrant people. Hey, Joe. Happy Independence Day. Happy Independence Day, Joe. We wanted to know more, so there was only one option. We would have to go to Africa to see the crisis firsthand. Our plan was to visit refugee camps in Ethiopia. By hearing directly from the refugees themselves, maybe we'd be able to uncover the truth about why people are leaving this mysterious country. Following Ethiopia, we'll fly to Israel to examine the fallout of the many Eritrean refugees entering the country seeking asylum. Along the way, we'll interview government officials, experts on the ground, and dozens of Eritrean refugees. I put together a small crew for the trip. Scott, a colleague of mine, decided to join me. Hey, Scott. And we arranged to have a guide and translator meet us when we landed. 
out of all my trips, this adventure would be different. Everything's going to be fine. The administration, it's so hard to say. The administration for refugee and returning affairs. Administration for refugee and returning affairs. Together with the UNHCR, they run the refugee camps in the north. And we're going to try to get some interviews. <laughs> So we were told to sit down and not shoot anything in the offices. A lot of them are afraid of um, the consequences of talking to some reporters. The answers were not coming as easily as I had hoped. Our guide explained that they feared speaking openly because if the Eritrean government found out that they had left, their families back home could be fined, imprisoned, or even killed. We're going to be going to the northern region, uh, Shire. Shire. It's his camp? Uh, oh, the other one. Mayani. Mayani. Adi Arush. Adi Arush. Harush. Arush. There's an H. I'm excited. Are you excited? Going to some refugee camps. Eritrea has one of the most repressive governments in the world, and so people flee in order to um, enjoy civil liberties, to escape human rights abuses. But the largest form of control in Eritrea is through this endless military conscription. If you'd like to control your citizens, put them in the army forever. And that's exactly what happens. Although conscription is supposed to be at 18, individuals as young as 14, even younger sometimes, are taken and conscripted to military conscription in the Eritrean army. Not everybody is guarding borders or, or in, you know, there's no active war right now. A lot of them are in forced labor and slavery-like conditions, forced to build the second homes of their commanders, to work in construction and agricultural fields, not for the betterment of the Eritrean people, but rather to line the pockets of their commanders with money, things that people view as, as a sort of corruption uh, within the Eritrean military. And they don't know how long they're going to serve. They don't know what their future holds. And so rather than deal with that, they leave and go to other countries. Eritreans leave their country however they can, crossing the border at their own peril to Ethiopia, Sudan, Yemen, or Djibouti. They risk being killed by the military or kidnapped and held for ransom. If they are lucky, they are picked up by the border patrol and brought to a processing facility like this one in Inda Abaguna, just outside of Shire. On this particular weekend, over 300 refugees arrived at the facility. Upon arrival, they go through the following process. An application is completed and an interview conducted to determine their asylum status. They are then photographed, fingerprinted, and given a ration card. Their information is then put into a database and their files are stored here in this room. Each one is then assigned an open refugee camp. Once a camp reaches full capacity, they open a new one to accommodate the growing number of displaced people. There are four refugee camps in the Shire region alone, with a combined total of over 94,000 refugees. This is only 30% of the documented refugees who have fled Eritrea as of July 2014. You want to speak to some refugees? 
we were introduced to the facilities protection officer, who allowed us to sit in on the interview process. Finally, we would begin to hear directly from the refugees themselves. Prisons in Eritrea are underground containers. They're hot, hot, hot. The conditions amount to cruel and inhumane degrading treatment in these prisons. For example, I spoke with an Eritrean who has been in prison for three years. He told me that the door to the prison was only opened once every two weeks so they could take out the bodies. This is what we're talking about. And so I think a lot of people, a lot of Eritreans, refer to Eritrea as one big prison, like the North Korea of Africa. That is a lot of refugees for one weekend. <laughs> <laughs> 